I don't reject all of the stories told about Jesus in the New Testament. I'm aware of a growing number of people who suspect Jesus is a fictional character, and for good reason. But it is my humble opinion that Jesus really existed. For the last few years, when I read through the New Testament, I try to imagine what most likely happened in a more realistic way. I do read my Bible often, and I recognize how these stories can snowball and become embellished over time. I can assemble a reasonable account for what is fabrication and what probably really happened. If you ever wanted to know who I think Jesus was and how Christianity was born, come on in and have a listen. It's story time. The journey begins around 1500 BC with a nomadic people I will refer to as Hebrews. These people lived between the trading routes of giant nations such as the Great Egyptian Empire that inhabited a large fertile Nile just southwest of the Middle Eastern wastelands. These hardened Hebrews had to survive in the expansive desert areas without much fertile ground. Because of the scarcity of green land, the Hebrews had to fight fiercely to occupy the desired areas available to build their own kingdom. The Hebrews overcame their enemies and secured the green fertile lands on the Mediterranean Sea just north of Egypt and south of Europe, now known as Israel. They have wrestled to keep this land ever since. This small fertile area was much sought after by all desert people who fought to build empires for themselves. The fight for this land was brutal and ongoing, even to this day. To understand the formation of a Christian God, we must look closely at these Hebrews. They were the little guy. They had short man syndrome and they wanted the biggest truck on the block. They had to conceptualize a God that was so powerful that he even ruled over the Egyptian gods. We see this being described in the book of Exodus when Moses shows the power of this God over Egypt. The entire story is a simple PowerPoint to show off how this God is more powerful than the mightiest of nations. Despite a larger-than-life God, the life for a Hebrew was small and difficult. They were constantly fighting their neighbors and trying to secure this small, fertile area. They were frequently being attacked, taken into slavery, and spread all through the neighboring lands. They even fought amongst themselves as fierce rivals. The only thing they could manage to hang on to was their religious writings. These writings became their only foundation for an identity. They struggled to keep themselves together, and their prophecies reveal this, as they were always written with an intent to make them feel better about tomorrow. They wrote about promises and covenants made by their God to ensure themselves that someday things will get better. This promise became the very root of their religion and all focus aimed on a future. Someday they would have a kingdom that ruled the entire earth and the fighting would end. God chose them as a special people with a promise that their suffering will not last forever. These promises served as a coping mechanism for a war-torn people. In hindsight, this God was not all that unique. They in fact borrowed much of their cultural and religious traditions, including creation stories and a flood, which resemble common stories told by many other cultures. The Hebrews placed their holy relics in a golden chest crested with angelic wings and carried it into battle on wood poles, keeping the people who carry the chest from touching the holy God, just as the Egyptians had done. They built a temple for their God to live in, including a room, the holiest of holies, which God occupied, and they made sacrifice tables just like the temples of all the other gods. 
they etched their laws into stone, just like the other nations. The God of the Bible has little originality aside from promises of a better future. We have animals being sacrificed to forgive people of their sin so that God won't get angry and send pestilence on their crops. Hebrews believed that leprosy, deformities, and all kinds of trouble were punishment from God due to their sin. These sacrifices were very important to help keep them from God's wrath. A Hebrew text known as Isaiah 53 describes a suffering servant. This was not a prophetic passage. It was a song performed in past tense and is recognized as the nation of Israel, which is referred to as a single person who suffers for the iniquity of others. This song makes sense when you think about how the Hebrews tried to understand all of their misfortune. The idea of somebody suffering for others or taking lashings for other people's sin was the only way they could explain the constant suffering of each new generation. These ideas are not original to Jesus. The ingredients for Christian theology had been conceptualized and addressed long before Christianity appeared. With this understanding, we can move on to later Hebrew books, such as Daniel, probably written sometime around 200 BC. After King Nebuchadnezzar wipes out the entire line of David in 589 BC and destroys the temple, prophetic writings become potent. The Hebrews wanted nothing more than to return home, take back their lands, and rebuild a temple. The book of Daniel becomes explicit about this new kingdom and a new temple for their God. An accumulation of this concept emulsified into a small handful of verses in later Hebrew writings such as Zechariah 12.10 and Micah 5.2. They all consistently describe four main points in the future when there is going to be a total transformation of the world. Number one, one day all the Jewish people, including the ten lost tribes of Israel, will return to their homeland. Number two, all of the Jews will return to being Torah observant. Number three, the Jewish temple will be restored in Jerusalem where every Jew will practice all of their ceremonies, sacrifices, and rituals. Number four, all of the world's nations are going to come to the Jews and ask to learn about their God. There will be world peace at this time, and all of the world's weapons of war will be beat into plowshares. But wait, nothing about a Messiah? What is important to understand is that the Hebrew scriptures describe these prophecies clearly and consistently. There are no alternative descriptions offered. This is why the first generation of Christians had such trouble converting Jews. These Hebrew prophecies simply do not mention a single word about a Messiah who resurrects from the dead with a promise to return with a kingdom only for those who believe in him. This later Christian teaching was ludicrous to a Hebrew. The concept of a bodily resurrection, a trinity, or a reward of heaven for believing or hell for not believing is not a part of any Hebrew belief, nor can these concepts be found in the Old Testament. So how did Christians get their Messiah concept? If we search through the collection of Old Testament prophecies, we will find a small handful that mention a wise and righteous descendant of King David who will be king at that time. This is all that the Hebrew scriptures ever tell us about what Christians like to call the Messiah. The Hebrew scriptures simply tell us that an anointed king from the line of David will be on the throne at that zenith time. That's it. Jesus simply did not fulfill these prophecies Therefore, we have a clear split from Judaism into Christianity. Christianity simply invented a new concept of a Messiah and a new kingdom. We will learn why in just a moment. I have gone ahead of myself, so I must back up. In the book of Daniel, the author wrote a very peculiar prophecy that provided the Hebrews with a timeline 
when all these future predictions will come to fulfillment. There is much controversy about the math, especially concerning the starting date, but between 25 BC and 25 AD, many Hebrew leaders believed the countdown was complete and they should be looking for the arrival of this anointed king. During the lifetime of Jesus, this Messiah buzz was in full bloom. Many people came forward to claim the Messiah title during this era, which is verified historically and even within the New Testament scriptures. Jesus was no doubt the most popular to make a grab for this title. I have found zero historical evidence to support Jesus performing any miracles, which I detail in my video number four, Miracles, but he did successfully produce a devout following. Jesus was a Jewish apocalyptic teacher like John the Baptist, who preached what many were craving to hear. At this time, the Greek language and its influence was dominant. The Roman Empire had secured vast control over all nations and tribes surrounding the Mediterranean. The landscape had changed, the language had changed, and war was no longer the Hebrews' struggle, but Roman influence, oppression, and poverty became the new enemy. The Hebrews are now under obedience to a foreign king and foreign gods. It is in this new world that they believe their God is going to fulfill all prophecies. The time is now, and Jesus takes center stage. I believe the key to his success was that he expressed inequality and the poverty of his people compared to that of Greco-Roman high life, and he even scalded his own Jewish people who had been given positions of power and taken advantage of Rome and its monetary opportunities. Jesus began teaching that the poor will be rewarded in the kingdom and the rich will be punished. Jesus welcomed in prostitutes, laborers, and all the downtrodden of society. I believe a lot of his attraction would have been because he truly did care about these poor people and their suffering. Jesus based his entire ministry on helping the poor and continually taught that they, the poor, would inherit the kingdom and the wealthy enemies will be overthrown. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person into the kingdom of God. In all my years of being a devout Christian, I never realized something the New Testament was telling me loud and clear. Jesus was building an armed rebellion, a militia. Why do I say this? There is key New Testament scriptures that strongly lead to this conclusion of a guerrilla warfare movement in the making. For one, Jesus' identity was being protected and hidden from the Romans. In order for Rome to capture Jesus, they had to bribe an insider with a lot of money to give up the whereabouts and identity of Jesus. We know this traitor as Judas Iscariot. This story would never had existed if Jesus were just an open, friendly guy building a peaceful movement. Jesus was preaching an apocalypse and the destruction of Rome. Jesus commanded his followers to sell their belongings in order to buy swords. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. The utter importance of building up weapons is made clear in this passage. Peaceful movements do not stress arming themselves, even giving up the clothes on their backs to do so. We also know that his disciples carried swords and were not afraid to use them. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Also, in Matthew, Jesus says, Don't think I am coming to bring peace. I come with a sword. Jesus was building up a rebellion, which was exactly what Jews were expecting and hoped for, and his followers became all of those who had nothing to lose. Jesus generates a sizable following over three years of his apocalyptic ministry, 
which no doubt led up to the Romans seeking to end this problem peacefully. Rome successfully purchased a traitor who delivered Jesus into custody and placed him before the courts. Jesus was accused of claiming to be king of the Jews under a Roman-controlled government and no doubt for inciting a rebellion. He was delivered for execution by crucifixion, which was a common Roman punishment for the worst of criminals, in order to distract anybody else from rising up another rebellion. Twenty to forty years later, Christians rewrote this story and blamed the Jews for killing Jesus and falsifying the story by claiming the Romans had no problem with Jesus. This is a ludicrous idea that many scholars refute. The book of John, written 50 years later, refers to the Jews as sons of the devil because they would not convert. But it is here that I must back up. After Jesus was tried and executed, we still do not experience a split from Judaism. Christianity required time to invent itself. So how did Christians get this Messiah concept? For every Jew who might have placed some hope for Jesus being the guy, after the execution, he simply was no longer the one who would usher in the new kingdom. It was not that big of a deal for most Hebrews, and they went about their day as every other day. However, for the devoted followers who supported Jesus for three years of their life, they were now trying hard to understand what happened. A large movement like this would not simply dissolve overnight. They lived together and shared all things in common. They did not pack their bags and go home. When people realized they could lose their lives and leaders were being threatened, the movement had to take new direction. Jesus taught them to love the poor people, and this is what they would continue to do. They laid down their swords and submitted to establishing a new understanding. Sometimes the death of a cherished leader will not end a passionate mission, but oftentimes will fuel it. Some of them most likely had great scriptural knowledge and could read or even write. A few dominant people would have began taking the leadership role to keep the movement together and worked hard at reinterpreting Jesus' death not into a loss, but into a celebration. All of the ingredients for the Christian theology were already there. It was crystal clear. Jesus became the suffering servant spoken of in the highly prophetic book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Although this suffering servant never was a future messianic passage, and contains several discrepancies that contradict the man Jesus, the framework was spot on. The farming of Hebrew scripture began, and the piecing together of a new religion fell into place organically. His death was now a victory. It was time to spread the good news. Jesus is now up in the heavenly kingdom next to God, Moses, and Elijah. But wait, what about the prophecies? None of them are fulfilled. Rome is still oppressing them. No problem. Jesus will return with all of the angels to defeat all of the enemies, and the kingdom will descend from heaven. As time goes on, these stories needed stronger explanations, such as a resurrection of Jesus' physical body. People needed to know he survived death. It's classic. Many people saw him, and he rose up into the clouds as he promised to return within their generation to fulfill all prophecies. And just like that, the fundamental framework for Christianity was fully established and a new religion began evolving. Over the next ten years, a more solidified picture of the Christian theology began to emerge. Within 20 years, writings began to emerge from stories that had been told and retold orally for over 20 years. I do not believe an empty tomb or resurrection story existed early on. An unknown burial landmark is a strong testimony 
that Jesus' body was most likely burned up with all the other criminals. If the empty tomb story really happened, it would have remained a sacred and known place of worship to this day. Furthermore, Jesus having an unknown date for his time of death is highly suspect for a person who was so revered by so many and is a clear indicator that the early Christians chose to distance themselves from what really happened to his body. Furthermore, the empty tomb and resurrection stories that were written down in the Gospels do not agree with each other, further indicating these stories developed over time. They are also filled with fantastic magical events, such as a great earthquake, a noonday sky turning to night, and dead people rising out of their graves and walking around in the cities, all upon Jesus' death. These unbelievable stories have no historical footprint and should be easily recognized as fabrications. Many years later, people are simply gathering and writing down these tales that have been told and shared over the course of years and decades. The very first Christians to launch these stories were more than happy to see them snowball and attract more followers. Here is an example. Jesus himself never claimed to be God, nor did the first Christians make any such declaration. The three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, never speak of Jesus being anything more than a son of God. But John, written much later than the three synoptics, around 90 AD, boldly teaches that Jesus was God and birthed the concept of a trinity. The New Testament itself reveals how an evolution of Jesus over the course of 50 years took shape within these communities. Another strong indication that many of these stories were fabricated and evolved is the fact that Paul became the prominent teacher of the Christian message and wrote a large portion of the New Testament. Oddly enough, Paul was never an acquaintance of Jesus. They never met. Those who started the new religion seem to have remained eerily silent on the matters. Four centuries later, the Gospels are given titles with apostle names, but the writings themselves are anonymous. As time carries on, Christians continued to farm the Old Testament for anything that sounded like Jesus, and worked very hard at pressing their new theology back into the Old Testament in order to lend credibility to their claims. Christians continued this effort well into the Middle Ages, claiming that nearly 300 passages refer to Jesus. It is a bold deception. These deceptive efforts are detailed in my video number 8, Fulfillment Prophecies. Regardless of these deceptive practices, the early Christians put their swords away and preached love and peace instead of war. They preached heavy on God's grace and lightened up a bit on the apocalypse. They were not going to have to fight because Jesus was going to return with the angels and take them up into the clouds far away from the battle. Jesus' sacrifice was one of love and the pagans ate this story up. It was a fantastic story. I admit that it truly is, and one that took Christianity from being a small Jewish rebellion to a full-blown pagan religion in less than a century. It was adopted by the Roman Empire and became the official state religion by the late 3rd century. If one looks closely at Christianity compared to Judaism, it becomes clear just how much pagan and Greek influence plays into the Christian theology and its practices. That is another story for another time. If you have enjoyed this video, please visit Stairway to Reason where you can find my 16 video series and other informative videos. Stay strong and wise, my friends. It's tough out there.